Tick tock, time to rock. How's everyone doing this evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you may be? I am David Wood, your friendly neighborhood philosopher, and with me right now are two reformed guys, which basically means they don't believe that Christianity started until John Calvin came along. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, let these guys introduce themselves and their cult. Uh, Anthony. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Ninety nine point something percent of people who are watching right now know both both who, both you guys. But uh, go ahead and inter- introduce yourselves anyway, just in case. Anthony, how you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I would introduce myself by saying that as a historically reformed Protestant, I recognize that Calvin preceded both Arminius as well as Louis de Molina. I'd also observe that Augustine preceded all of them, so uh, I, I feel myself to be in good company, as well as Thomas Aquinas, by the way, a good uh, Augustinian, at least with respect to his views on God's sovereignty. Um, are you course, are you speaking Hebrew because no one understood anything you just said? All right, vocab. And of course, also <laughs> Paul Paul preceded all of them. Yeah, my name is Vocab Malone. I do a thing called Street Apologists Live, and this is my first time I've been able to hang out with the Flu Tang Clan, a special series of uh, live streams that we make for the quarantine people. And I'm glad to be here for the first one, and I'm glad we could talk about pre-sup. And uh, I realize, David, there's a lot of people who watch your channel because you have so many growing subs they still have not subscribed to my channel, and they have not hit the bell. What? And they probably have not even considered becoming a patron. But I hope they can do one of those things before this show ends. I will block anybody who does not subscribe to Vocab's channel. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. All right, guys. So, uh, yep, uh, if you're tuning in now, then you might be interested in presuppositional apologetics, what it is, what it isn't, how it contrasts with... Uh, competing apologetic systems. Um, now, uh, vocab, Anthony, when people think of different kinds of apologetics, there's one that first comes to mind, satirical apologetics. So uh, why, don't, why don't you yeah. tell us what satirical apologetics would be? Both of us? One of us? Either one. Well, I mean, you know, of course, satirical apologetics is not necessarily a <laughs> Uh, a methodology proper, I don't think per se, but it is using satire in the ministry of apologetics. Apologetics is uh, at least twofold, defensive and offensive. So there's a side that's uh, defending Christianity from attacks, and there's a side that's polemical, that's offensive, that is going after competing worldviews and showing how they are ultimately incoherent mm-hmm. and confront them with the, the, the fact of their own internal self-contradictions. And so one way we do that latter exercise sometimes, especially here when we do things like the Boom Boom Room or Islamicize Me, those kinds of videos, one thing we do with that is go after Islam – and someone that they view as a prophet named Muhammad mm-hmm. and show how not only does he not live up to the standard of God's word, which is authoritative and final, he doesn't even live up to his own standards of his own religion as well. And so we will use satire to convey that. So it's sort of here's the vehicle and it's comedy, but inside the vehicle, what's being transported is information, is truth. So we use satire, comedy to convey information. Mm-hmm. All right, now, uh, Anthony, um, I, th- I think most people, when they think of apologetics, are not thinking of uh, what would be classified as presuppositional apologetics. So if they're familiar, most Christians, if they are familiar with apologetics, they're thinking of like uh, William Lane Craig or, you know, before that, like Josh McDowell, Ravi Zacharias, and so on. Uh, why don't you break down the difference between, uh, I guess, you? I, I'm assuming you would call it classical apologetics and presuppositional apologetics. Yeah, so actually I I would also make a distinction between classical apologetics and evidentialist apologetics. Often those two things go hand in hand, but even someone like William Lane Craig, who takes a classical approach, uh, would differ from evidentialists like uh, Gary Habermas, for example, on the necessity of beginning with arguments for the existence of God and then moving from there to historical arguments for things like the resurrection. So the classical approach is is basically the idea that uh, not only is there a natural revelation of God, but uh, there is something that we could call natural theology, man's ability to reason from 
the facts of experience or principles of reasoning uh, to the conclusion that God exists. And there's more that's involved in that, of course. And then the evidentialist approach would argue that, uh, furthermore, the, the truth of the Christian worldview in particular is established by arguments, say, for the resurrection as the chief fact of Christianity. And if you can demonstrate that Christ rose from the dead, then with that come a bunch of other things. Christ's uh, personal claims of divinity, uh, the inspiration of the scriptures, and so forth. Uh, the presuppositionalist approach is not necessarily a rejection of classical arguments for God, although it would insist on uh, them being formulated in a particular way, a way that is consistent with God's revelation of himself in Scripture. And it also wouldn't reject the use of evidence. Evidence, though, always is interpreted in terms of a worldview. And so if all you're doing is trying to shovel facts down someone's throat, then you're not necessarily challenging their underlying assumptions in terms of which they try to ride roughshod over the evidence. Uh, we can get into the, all of that more, but uh, that, that I would say uh, gives you something of an idea as we get started. Now, um, what? Uh, well, let's go with the percentage here. Uh, this question is for both of you. Um, for people who presuppositionalism is usually associated now with uh, with Van Til and then his bulldog, his bulldog Greg Bonson, but uh, what percentage would you say, because uh, what percentage would you say of the full Vantillian project would you be on board with? Well, so let, let me just throw, throw in here really quickly. I often hesitate to label myself a presuppositionalist, uh, and, and I do so for reasons similar to what I think Jesus was doing when he refused to simply call himself the Messiah. Uh, there were popular notions about who the Messiah would be, what he would come to do afoot in Israel. And for Jesus to simply say, I'm the Messiah, would be to you know feed into that. And they'd, they'd then identify him as a political ruler, or somebody who's come to lead Israel in its charge against Rome and uh, establish Jewish hegemony, that sort of thing. I don't happen to believe what most people think is the teaching of Van Til. So... Uh, on the one hand, I'd say, no, I'm not a Vantillian, if somebody means by that uh, what half the stuff I hear, uh, you know, actually is. But uh, as far as Van Til, I mean, I have shelves full of the literature of Van Til. I went to an undergraduate school uh, that was co-founded by Bonson. I went to a seminary where the teacher of apologetics was uh, a pastor with Bonson when he was alive uh, back in the 90s and before that. Uh, and so... Uh, as far as what Van Til actually taught, uh, I am, I would say, 95% on board in terms of, if we're talking about method, I'm not going to pretend that Van Til's, uh, there's nothing else to be said about Van Til's teachings that uh, I wouldn't be, uh, uh, you know, uh, of a different mindset on. How, how about you, Vocab? How much of a Van Tilian are you? I would be considered, I think, by someone like uh, Anthony as a soft presuppositionalist. <laughs> You're soft. <laughs> yeah, not, and I don't, I don't mind, you know, I don't mind that terminology at all. It doesn't bother me a bit. Uh, I mean, to be more technical, I'm sort of Framian. Now, I don't claim to be smart enough to fully understand everything that Van Til laid out, everything that Bonson said about Van Tilian thought, or everything that Frame has said in about his own thought, or when he interprets Van Til. So I'm a student of these things and, and trying to keep uh, going along, you know what I'm saying? But I am uh, into the primary insight uh, of Van Til, which I think, um, well, see, it's multiple things, but sort of the primary insights of Van Tilian thought, which is the supremacy of Scripture and the fact of, of applying Reformed theology to apologetic methodology. Uh, that, the, that project in and of itself uh, to me, are, are important and key. And I think Frame b buys into those basic things. Now, some of the guys that uh, Anthony mentioned, sort of the more hard-line guys, which I don't have anything against. They're all lots of smart guys and all that. Uh, sometimes we'll say that John Frame, who, again, is more where I think I line up with my thought world, is not really a true Vantillian. And uh, there's a couple reasons for that. And so there's even differences and shades of understanding within presuppositionalists, as hopefully you can tell right now. And I find Frame to be more amenable to other apologetic methodologies. And um, I just sort of like the way he writes that's charitable and yet erudite and scholarly. 
and I appreciate that. Now, someone in the live chat, Thrawn, which I wonder if your name is uh, Thrawn from the uh, the Grand Admiral from the Timothy Zahn Star Wars books. That'd be interesting if it was. It doesn't need to be reformed, Thrawn, but I think it's very difficult for someone who is not reformed to buy on uh, into the presuppositionalist apologetic because of some of the underlying assumptions are decidedly reformed, such as the complete um, – uh, the, the totalizing effects of sin on all areas of humanity. So it depends upon a reformed anthropology, and that gets into what's called the noetic effects of sin. It depends upon a, a high view of Scripture, uh, which is not necessarily just a reformed thing, don't get me wrong, but sort of the way it's looked as uh, this ultimate authority in such a sort of strong way is is more reformed than other traditions. And there's some other things, so it's not impossible but uh, it, I think it's difficult to be consistent because I have met a couple guys who say, yeah, I'm a pre or I like this about pre but I'm not reformed. And it's always a, sort of a, a delicate balancing act they've got to do because there's certain Vantillian presuppositions, which is really just reform presuppositions, that if you don't hold to, it, it's difficult to hold to the apologetic methodology of presuppositionalism because it relies upon the background of reform theology. All right. Um, we are getting well let me let me uh, address this one real quick first uh robert says uh david anthony and other dude <laughs> is that that's funny you like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> david anthony and other dude ever see lutheran satire channel on youtube as a catholic i find it first rate uh yeah i'll just say uh i mean there's only one there's only like two <clears throat> two videos that really stood out one is the uh horace ruins christmas one and then uh the uh the one where they're talking about the Trinity, Connell and Madonnell or whatever, <laughs> yeah, Connell, yeah, yeah, Donald yeah, yeah. or something like that, are, 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 uh, are responding to uh, attempts to describe the Trinity or something like that. But uh, St. Patrick, St. Yeah, Patrick yeah, yeah. and the analogies, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the Horace, Horace Ruins Christmas one is, uh, was, uh, was classic. But, uh, yeah, what do you guys think? Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. like it. Why did vocab I mean, get giant all of a sudden? I'm uh, working on. Um, uh, I was. I was like. I'm like all whited out with this weird yellow tint, and so I'm trying to mess around with the webcam settings. But uh, I, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna fix it as we as we go along, so where I'm not so big. Okay. Uh, in the screen. Just know um, if if if, vo if vocab or uh, as he's called here, other guy uh, freaks you out. Just know he'll be. Uh, he'll be tweaking that um, along the way. And uh, one we've gotten. Uh, we've gotten several comments along the lines of. Um. Could somewhat could somebody dumb this down for the rest of us? So let's be under the assumption that there are a lot of people here who may not have much of a background at all in apologetics. They might follow my channel just because they love it when I, you know, wreck Muhammad and the Quran and stuff like that. Um, they, 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 so they, they might know us all from from them. But apologetics, different kinds of apologetics. Even like reformed theology and stuff like that, maybe they have no background whatsoever in in any of that. So as we go along, let's try to break stuff down into terms that everyone will grasp. All right, where would you guys like to start? If, uh, uh, if you guys see any questions that you'd like to address along the way, feel free to jump in anytime with those. Um, I'll bring up some questions here and there. Oh, wait, hey, where, look, look what we got here. Where is it? Uh, well, wow. the member just wanted to give a shout out to Tony Costa okay. right here. Nah, I'm trying to shout out Tony Costa real quick, man. I see. Oh, yeah, we got some super chats, too. Um, Tony Costa said, uh, hi, David, give Anthony and vocab my regards from another reformed apologist in Canada. Gosh, you guys are spreading like coronavirus. What the heck? <laughs> yeah, and we're sick, too. Uh, shout out to Thunder Bear for joining yeah. the Boom Squad. All right. What do you uh, what do you guys what are you guys thinking? It gives me an idea, first of all, that coronavirus is going to be my new example when Muslims say that Islam is true because it spreads so quickly. I used to say gangrene spreads quickly and so forth. Uh, that doesn't prove it's something you should want or like, but uh, I guess now coronavirus is more applicable. Well, yeah, and I, I did post a video of a Muslim, uh, Muslim imam claiming that uh, coronavirus is a soldier of Allah, so he'd probably appreciate that. <laughs> uh, well... All right, guys. Who wants who wants to break down first? First, why don't we why don't we go ahead? Elephant in the room. Why don't you go ahead and break down? Give us a quick nutshell view of reformed theology. And before someone says, "David, you're promoting reformed theology," I'm not reformed, guys. I'm not reformed. But uh, it's one of the one of the main positions. Some of the guys I work with all the time are reformed, 
And so got no problem with them uh, explaining their position, which is kind of necessary for understanding um, presupp uh, presuppositional ap apologetics. So who wants to jump on that one? Uh, well, I'll, I'll say something and vocab can chime in. Um, so, so I'd begin with this. First of all, in the history of the Christian church, and I, I should make a distinction so nobody misunderstands me, oftentimes we throw around the word heresy very loosely, but there are actually uh, ways of categorizing it that should be understood when people are talking accurately, at least in terms of the you know ecclesiastical uh, language that's been worked out in the church. Heresy is any departure from the truth. Right? It doesn't matter whether it's a difference over baptism or a difference over, you know, rapture views, whatever it might be. Any departure from the truth is truly and properly a heresy. Now, that means that people can hold views that aren't accurate, that are, in fact, heretical, that aren't necessarily inconsistent with salvation. So uh, if uh, but the reason I bring this up is because historically— the Church has, in one council after another, repeatedly condemned what's known as uh, Pelagianism, which is the notion that people can be saved apart from grace, and have even said, quite repeatedly, that any views that try and mix grace with works in salvation is, in fact, a departure from Scripture and is heretical. You can look even, for example, at the, the Council of Orange as a good example of that. Now, this, this perspective ultimately comes to a head at the time of the Reformation, because the Roman Catholic Church at that time had so thoroughly mingled works in grace as to completely overturn the doctrine of justification by faith. According to Rome, justification, uh, being righteous before God, forgiven of your sins and given a title to eternal life, was the result of a cooperative effort between God and man. The Reformers, Luther, in fact, before Calvin, looked at this and, and were aghast because they recognized that if salvation depends on us in any way, then we have no hope. And that's because Scripture does not present the high views of man that uh, any kind of works-based salvation or even a cooperative view of grace and works, any kind of view of man that would suggest that's possible. Scripture just doesn't countenance such an idea. And, and by the way, and let me just throw this in here, uh, people like John Wesley, who would in fact be referred to as Arminians, actually had an extremely uh, strong view of human depravity. Uh, that's why Wesley would be defined as an uh, evangelical Arminian, and I would actually have great affinity, at least with, with Wesley's view of human depravity. He believed that man was totally depraved and incapable of believing in Christ apart from divine grace. But the difference is that Wesley would then say that God has given this grace to all men. That's where the difference comes in. But a lot of Christians don't even know that difference. right? A lot of Christians think, oh no, we can just believe in God independently of grace. But even somebody like John Wesley recognized nobody can believe in God apart from grace. Believing in God is a work of the Spirit in the heart of man, enabling him to put his trust in Christ. And so that, that's kind of, in a nutshell, uh, what Reformed theology is. There is, of course, a lot more there, and I'll leave the rest of that to vocab. Oh, i got to explain the rest of Reformed theology. Yeah. <laughs> any, anything you'd like to add on Reformed theology, slow cap? Well, uh, yeah, a few things. Um, um, Reformed theology is basically got its name from the key principles that came out of the Reformation, and so those principles are uh, decidedly scriptural and given in light over and against Roman Catholic theology at the time, but they still are historic Christianity regardless of if there is a Rome or not. So we're saved by faith alone, through grace alone, through Christ alone, through the, for the glory of God alone, which is sort of the overriding one in my view. And we know this uh, from Scripture alone. That's the sole sort of authoritative, uh, ultimate authority we have on these matters. Now, with that being said, there can be more specific things to say. So then, as Anthony mentioned, salvation, that's where the big dividing line is. And so when we look at salvation, the theology of it is called soteriology. 
We say, how is a person saved? What does the Bible say about it? And so that's where sometimes people hear of the tulip idea. Now, the tulip is not invented to explain Calvinistic or Reformed thought. It was done in response to an Arminian council that had happened where some of the people who were coming out of the Reformation leaving Rome said, ah, maybe we went too far. And so basically some folks who followed uh, Ar- Arminius got together and came up with five points of their system, and the Calvinists responded with total depravity. And the idea is there's a thoroughly radical corruption in regards to the sin that affects all components of man and woman, and key upon that in regards to presuppositionalism, David, is the noetic effects of sin. What that means, everybody, is that the unbeliever's mind is corrupted, and that's why the Bible says things like their foolish hearts were darkened, and in their own they were wise in their own eyes, but they they became fools. That's the idea. And Scripture says that the what's the beginning of wisdom? It's the fear of the Lord. So the unbelieving person lacks that, and so it's not that they don't know anything about anything. It's just saying that the 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 use of reason, people's reason, is corrupted as well. Not that reason or logic itself is corrupted, because that's a reflection of God's mind. Reason and logic itself are not corrupted, but the way man utilizes them, you know, those things certainly is. So the you is unconditional election, that there's no precondition by which God says, I'm going to save this one and not save that one. It's not, oh, I knew they were going to choose. God ordains who he elects, and it's not based upon any conditions other than, as Ephesians 1 says, according to the counsel of his own will for the glory of his for the glory of, of, of his for his own grace, meaning, you know, the, the, out of the riches of his own grace. I'm paraphrasing some of Ephesians 1, trying to get through this fast. But the point is that that he does this as he wants to do this. And who can hold his hand back, as Isaiah says, or say, what are you doing that for? L is the choking point, and that's okay. It's understandable. Sometimes called limited atonement. Some people like the idea of particular redemption better. The idea is that the son perches out a specific chunk of humanity. So when he says it is finished, he's saying, I have completed the work necessary for those who will be saved, i.e. the elect or the chosen, with my death. And they are now bought and purchased. Now the events unfold in time, meaning you're saved at a certain date and place, but that's because that was ordained and your salvation was purchased back at Calvary. And that's why Paul says we were crucified with him. It's like, wait, how are we there? And that's where this idea of union with Christ comes in. And so then the I is irresistible grace. The idea is that grace is efficacious, that it will work its intended purpose. Uh, If the Lord wants to save Saul of Tarsus as he's going to drag Christians before courts and throw them in jail and maybe even have some of them killed, the Lord will do that, and it will happen. Now, he acts upon the will of Paul so that Paul also wants to do what God has ordained, and that's where the idea of compatibilism comes in, at least partially, but it will happen, and and the, the creature is not, it can't can't stop it. The creature is not going to be able to, to thwart those plans of God. Uh, the Holy Spirit will save whom he saved. The Holy Spirit's not working against the Son, and the Son is not working against the Father. There's a co-harmonious relationship in regards to salvation, and that's where the I comes in. Lastly, the P, preservation of the saints or perseverance of the saints. The idea is that Uh, And along with John 10, where he says, they're in my hand, no one's going to be able to pluck them out. That includes ourselves, that includes Satan. We are with him. He loses none out of those who are given him, the the Bible says as well. And the idea is there is that those who are saved are saved. And a big proof text for that, besides what I've already mentioned, is 1 John 2, 19. When you see people who seem to have walked away from the faith, John's explanation is they were actually never believers to begin with, despite whatever appearance there there happens to be. And so that's those five points. Now, they only deal really with soteriology. There's other questions questions the Reformed theology touches and whatnot. And the idea is not that other Christians aren't saved. The idea is not that we've invented this thing in the 1500s. The idea is this is consistent with the biblical revelation. It was sort of hammered down, finally chiseled during the Reformation. And then there's an apologetic methodology that's consistent with those insights that all we're saying is we find it to be the most biblical, and I'm willing to grow and learn along the way, but that's the essence of it, and I hope that made sense to some people. Um, This is... uh... It's a little off topic, but could you guys wouldn't wouldn't you be able to spread your view more effectively if you came up with like a tougher acronym than tulip? <laughs> you know what I mean, I I didn't make it up. You know, I didn't make it up. Like Calvinism like, is <laughs> like like if it was. Like, I mean, and plus, uh, I, I have to say, you know, you, you so, we, we talk uh, about the, we talk about these cage stage Calvinists that are going around all all mean and nasty, and then it's like, oh, we're giving you the tulip, right? I mean, like, 
choke slam, something like right. that. You know what I mean? Like, well, like come up with something that 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 spells out choke slam or something like that. You know, it, it would fit yeah. better. But go ahead. Choke, well, choke slam. Uh, ju ju just to be fair here, it should be remembered that the dispute between reformed ministers, Arminius was a reformed minister, and so were his followers. They were uh, the dispute came out of the Netherlands, where the the national flower was the tulip, and so that's part of the reason for that. However, it should be remembered that Reformed people have often pointed out that the uh, equivalent uh, flower representative of Arminianism is the daisy. He loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. So so we do have something to say to that. Uh, no need to get rude, Anthony, but uh, gosh, the Netherlands. Can anything good come out of there? Um, <laughs> not perhaps lately. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to uh, Dean Lumpkin Jr. for uh, joining the the Boom Squad and uh, see the super chats here, ladies. We'll 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 get to these. Uh, we'll we'll make sure we get to all these uh, or as much as we can uh, shortly. But all right, guys. Presuppositional apologetics. Presuppositional apologetics. What is it in Anthony. the simplest terms? And and may may maybe maybe for people who. Uh, Maybe for if anyone's still, because we understand that there are people who this may be completely new. They may have some difficulty uh, understanding what's going on. There are also people for whom English is a second language or sometimes third or fourth language and so on. So they might have a little difficulty. So after you guys break it down, then maybe uh, maybe we'll practice a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll be an atheist or a skeptic or something like that. And you can maybe show us different kinds of approaches. So you show us how like a classical apologist might uh, respond to something I'm saying and then compare that with, some, with, with how a, a presuppositional apologist might, uh, might explain it. But all right, who wants to go first? I was going to read from Doug Powell's book and then let Anthony do commentary. Oh, Pre sure. Presuppositionalism is a method that is deeply rooted in epistemology our theory of knowledge, or how we can know what we know. Rather than arguing from evidences or the traditional philosophical proofs for Christianity, presuppositionalists employ transcendental arguments to make their case. A transcendental argument is a deductive argument that seeks to explain the necessary conditions for some fact or phenomenon. The premises of a transcendental argument assert the existence of that fact, and the conclusion specifies what must be the case for that fact or phenomenon to exist. Thus, presuppositionalists are more concerned with what makes evidence evidential and what makes reason reasonable. Because the God of the Bible is the creator of all things, we know that he is not just the source of all physical things— we know that he is not just the source of all physical things, but all laws, whether they be scientific laws, moral laws, or logical laws. Therefore, there can be no reason or logic, for example, apart from God. And I'll stop there and let him comment, but this is just saying this. Someone would be like, you believe in God? Give me your reason. Give me your evidence. All we're saying is we can do that. Sometimes there's a stereotype of Van Til and and us that we don't believe in evidence or we believe it's strictly uh, superf superfluous, useless, meaningless, like it's just a – no, we believe in use of evidence. It's in the proper context. And so all we're saying is before we talk about give me your evidence or what's your reason, we're saying let's take a step back and say why is there even this category of evidence that – that exist. Why is that? What is what is reason, and why do we think reason is a valid way for determining something? So we're trying to step back, and and ask this question. And when it comes to an atheist, for example, we engage in a transcendental critique, and that's where you say your worldview does not provide the necessary preconditions for intelligibility in the first place. In the first. And so part of it is stepping back to say, what are your presuppositions? And also challenging the presuppositions of the unbeliever that they hold. And we're just saying, okay, you want to talk about that? We could talk about that. But let me ask you, why do you even assume that's something we can do to give evidence, to have a debate, to engage it? Why do we do that? And there, there's reasons, but they only comport ultimately with the Christian worldview. Anthony, I'm going to pass it over to you there. Uh, before you do, you just uh, used a bunch of big words. So let's, did, did let's talk. I? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Um, so another elephant in the room, transcendental. 
Um, Because that's going to be... Anthony, if you were to describe Transcendental in simpler words... um, Break that down for us, and and let, let, let's just. I, I said we. I said we'd. Uh, uh, I'd said that we would uh, do some conversation. But s- suppose I were an atheist, and I said um, I came at you with, let's say, the the logical argument from evil. I said, um, hey, you know, if there's a if there's a god with, if there's a god who's all powerful, then he would be he would have the power to stop all evil and suffering. Um, if he was all knowing, he would know how to do it. And if he was perfectly good, then he would want to get rid of all evil. Um, then there would be no evil, but there is all kinds of evil. Therefore, God doesn't exist. Um, what would, what do you, th- what, what are you targeting there? If you start talking about thinking transcendentally or responding, uh, pointing out a, a problem transcendentally there. Yeah. So in the first place, there's a direct response to that, but in this case, the transcendental argument is what's known as an indirect argument. Yeah. What you're doing is you're saying that this particular argument against Christianity already presupposes something that isn't true apart from the Christian worldview. And that's because the God of the Bible, the God of Scripture, is the precondition, and this is a way of defining transcendental, he is the precondition, that which must be true, in order for evil or anything else to be intelligible. It makes no objective sense to speak of something being evil, really and truly evil, if there is no ultimate standard. It's like me saying, and I let me see if I can, it, I know that I'm only half or part in the screen here, You're right but if I, say I, I, if I say I caught a fish this long, you know, this is, this is the, my point of measurement, you'd say, wait a minute. You know, what, what's uh, you, I need to see the other hand here, mm-hmm. right? You need some sort of starting point in terms of which to say how long this fish is. Well, without the God of the Bible, what we're saying is there is no ultimate principle or, uh, you know, starting point in terms of which we can measure anything and say that it doesn't measure up or say that it's evil or say that it's wrong. And so the argument itself, ironically, presupposes the truth of Christianity. And this is where Van Til, and hopefully this illustration will help a little bit, Van Til said that the unbeliever is like a little girl who reaches up and slaps her father in the face when the only way she could do so is if her father was holding her up the entire time. So uh, the unbeliever is ultimately resting upon the God of Scripture, even in order to argue against the God of Scripture. And this kind of goes back to the whole Reformed theology thing. What what you're seeing here is that the God of Scripture is just that big. His existence is inescapable. Even arguments that are calculated to reject him themselves end up only being possible if, in fact, he exists and is who he says he is. So a a uh, a not necessarily a trans. I mean, not necessarily a Vantillian response, or not necessarily uh, what what you guys might say, but but j- just to go along with the the kind of thing a transcendental uh, response to an objection is. If someone were to use the what's called the, the logical argument from evil, you would point out, hey, um, you've already you've already assumed or presupposed that there is a standard for good which doesn't exist in your worldview. It, it exists in mine. Uh, you're using logical laws. You're appealing to uh, valid logical inference here, which 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 you know makes no sense um, if there's no sort of ground of logical laws or source of of uh, of correct thinking in that manner. Um, you're assuming that you're assuming not only that there are logical laws and moral laws that would that apply universal universally um so much so that they would apply even to god you're assuming that you are aware of them and that you are the kind of thing that has access to these universal laws almost like gosh almost like you're created in the image of god or something like that so he's basically pointing out hey nothing you're saying right now makes sense nothing if 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 we were to take your worldview seriously Nothing you are saying right now at all makes sense. This entire conversation, all everything you're claiming, everything you're arguing, and expecting me to be able to go along with you, that only makes sense on my worldview, does not make sense on your worldview. And so if you're assuming, if you're assuming all of these things that only make sense of my on my worldview, and you're using that to try and attack my worldview, you're just you're completely incoherent. You have no clue what you're talking about. 
Uh, well, it sounds like you're a better defender of presuppositionalism than we are. You're doing a great job. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going, I'm, I'll be, I'll be honest here. That that's kind of how I've always uh, thought, and mainly it's, it's kind of, it's kind of historical from my perspective, right? I mean, I was someone who had like mm -hmm. the breakdown of all his mental faculties trying to be consistent with, uh, with my worldview. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. so, so with the. My, my my view is, as far as that goes, yes, I'm always thinking that, right? When I have an atheist beside me and he's saying all these things and making all these arguments, all I'm thinking is, all I hear from this atheist is, I'm created in the image of God. I'm created in the image of God. I'm created in the image of God and then denying God, right? Uh, that's all mm -hmm. I hear from from the atheist. Where, if uh, uh, Anthony was already talking about reformulating the arguments, I want to, I want, I'd like to reformulate a lot of the classic arguments as um as okay it's either it's either god or we're we're completely irrational uh, and or, or crazy yeah, god or, god or absurdity i mean yeah that mm -hmm. to me that sounds very presuppositional that because no you know, no no talking about ethics the the idea is ethics requires ethics demands mm -hmm. god at the center god at the core you know you're talking about <clears> same <throat> thing with logic or reason so just like anthony gave the illustration with the little girl the idea is she's sitting on his lap mm -hmm. and so the atheist for example is attacking the source of reason using reason mm -hmm. That's, that's exactly what's going on there. So, so uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm with it 100 percent so far. Yeah, and if 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 yeah, if, uh, I'm 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 saying this to try and break it down for for uh, for anyone who might not be familiar with this stuff. But the idea is just just give a more uh, uh, more uh, specific example um, on the topic of morality. Um, you'll have atheists saying, "Up, oh, there are." I mean, I've I've been dealing with them for a couple weeks now. Uh, non-stop sending me comments ha 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 you can't prove that there are objective moral values and so on the idea is these are the same atheists will say well if god exists he should do this if god exists he should do that if god exists he should do this they're claiming that they that not only that there are moral values that would even apply to god they're claiming that they have access to them that makes no sense given what they say about themselves and given that they're denying that there are objective moral values right so it's yeah. just it's just a big mass of incoherent nonsense uh, coming towards me, and so yeah, my view is it's yeah it's if if we're to make sense, if we want to say no, here's this thing, here's you know Christianity is bad because of this, and Islam is bad because of this. If we're to make if we're to make sense of any of that, then there has to be a moral standard, and if you're simultaneously denying the moral standard, it's almost like this: if you think there is there there is no objective moral standard, well, we have a kind of moral sense that tells us that all these things are wrong and if there is no real right or wrong no objective right or wrong then our faculties for judging and for moral reasoning are massively defective so defective that we can't trust ourselves and the result would be we should be moral skeptic we should be moral skeptics claiming that we can't we just can't know uh, much of anything we can't trust ourselves but the same would apply down the line if you talk about our reasoning ability with anything if we were if we were really if our reasoning ability really came along because our ancestors who were able to think in certain ways were better able to find food and better able to find a mate those are the only kinds of things that natural selection selects for then it makes no sense for us to trust ourselves with philosophy and theology and science it doesn't make sense for us to be able to trust ourselves and yet we all do and so if i were to take your atheist worldview seriously i could not trust my own reasoning ability i certainly couldn't trust my moral reasoning ability i can't trust anything i don't know anything and we just we don't we don't believe that and therefore we don't really believe the atheist so i'm kind of on board with a lot of that but the idea i i think the problem a lot of people have with like the ventilian stuff is they it comes across as like here's the silver bullet right this is the silver bullet and and then uh, along with that it's this is the only right way to do apologetics and so uh you guys only started but we want to we want to get to that uh that kind of objection and one thing that i've seen come up uh repeatedly in the chat was the idea of what happens when a non-Christian theist reasons like this? So we want to get to those two issues, but first, let's continue. Let's continue the discussion yeah. on presuppositional uh, apologetics. Uh, since we were talking about morality, let me throw this in here, and maybe this will help people. 
If you guys watched David's debate recently with Matt Dillahunty, <clears throat> then you heard something of how an atheist might try to get around this issue of morality and evil and so forth. Uh, Dillahunty said that uh, morality is like a game. If a person wants to play the game, then there are certain rules that he has to play by. Uh, but then he also admitted that there's no non-arbitrary reason why someone has to play the game. And so anyone can freely choose to opt out of the game if he wants to, and the rules wouldn't apply to him. Now, there's a devastating problem here that Dilla Hunty didn't even seem to notice. Not only has he given a, you know, uh, get out of jail free card to anybody who chooses not to play the game, you know, morality doesn't apply to them. And by the way, just watch how quickly an atheist would try and impose morality on anyone who decided they didn't want to play the game, showing that they couldn't live by their own strictures. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, why, why, what, here's what Dilla Hunty didn't think through. Why does anyone have to play the game of life by certain rules or else forgo playing the game? Who is Matt or atheists collectively to dictate to everyone else that if they play the game, then it has to be played by certain rules? In this case, their rules, of course. Now, notice what the observation is here. It, it isn't simply that Dilla Hunty's view of morality has no binding authority over those who choose to play the game. It has no binding authority over those who do choose to play the game. Right? Why does anyone have to play the game according to such rules? In principle, there's no answer to this question on Dilla Hunty's assumptions. But uh, notice that in arguing that morality is you know, conventional, it's something that's true for people who want to play the game, uh, in saying it's conventional, you know, Dilla Hunty's rule that anyone who wants to play the game has to play it by these rules is a universal norm, mm -hmm. right? This is something that transcends the game. So what is he doing here? He's saying that morality is conventional or something along those lines, and this universal rule is what establishes this. So where does he get this universal moral norm? Mm -hmm. He's assuming the very thing that he's trying to argue against. The, the, the God of the Bible and the things that flow from his character, that God is inescapable. Matt Dillahunty was made in that God's image. He knows that God and can't escape then you know, thinking and speaking like his image bearer, even when he does so in perverse and rebellious ways. Yeah, uh, Romans 1, uh, 32 says... Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So Romans 1 is, in my view, uh, uh, the whole chapter is pretty key. Uh, someone earlier in the live chat mentioned Romans 120. It's key for presuppositional apologetics. It's not the only place, but it's an important uh, place to exegete in, in regards to presuppositionalism, I believe. And Romans 132 is saying the unbeliever has an awareness of sort of the ethical norms. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the being image bearers. That's big uh, for us is that all people are made in the image of God. And that's sort of where, to use the term, our common ground comes in because – uh, sometimes Van Til will say we don't have common ground, and then he'll, other times he'll say we do have common ground, and he kind of means it in different ways. And Francis Schaeffer, I think, explained it probably a little bit better, even though some people would say he was not, not enough of a Van Tilian, where he would describe, look, the atheists can deny God, for example, but yet they live in his world, in his creation. And that's important. And, you know, going back to the idea of moral standards, it is interesting, and Frame points this out on page uh, 72 of his book. Uh, this is the second edition. I like the title of the first one better, which is Apologetics to the Glory of God, but here's the second edition. And he says that if you look at the history of philosopher, when philosophers have tried to talk about moral obligations, they have tried to show in some way that they obligate, meaning there's a duty to them. So mm -hmm. when it comes to Plato, he hinges it on abstract ideas, Kant, logical deduction, utility, whether it's Bentham or Mill, intuition, more, feeling, Hume, and all of them end up basically refuting one another. And Frame points out this, and I'll actually quote this part. Moral standards can be obligatory only if their source is a person 
who deserves absolute obedience and reveals his will to human beings. And I think that's true. So the, again, ethics uh, requires God. It demands it. And I think we need to uh, recognize that fact. And all we're saying is we do. So when the presupposition is said, or when the, the, when the, when the atheist, for example, makes a critique and it says, well, why did, why did God murder, you know, you know, that they phrase it. Why did he have a, a genocide or whatever the case is, right? Why did he do this? You know, these Old Testament uh, ob, uh, ob objections that you often get. Um, we can take that step back and say, are you saying murder is objectively morally wrong? And if so, let's talk about why. Now, for me, I believe we can have that conversation and sometimes um, even have a taste of it where that may not be all there is. I do think we can move on then and say, well, let me uh, show, uh, you know, the, 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 for example, when it comes to the Canaanites, that's not genocide, that's God's judgment. Now, I'm presupposing there's a God who enacts his will, that he's revealing himself in history, but I don't deny those presuppositions because I'm a Christian. Uh, you know, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm doing up in here. And so I think, it's, I think it's important to kind of recognize it, but I'm okay to go further and continue to deal with the evidence. Now, David, you mentioned some of the things that people have a problem with presuppositionalists, and I'll stop after I say this. Sometimes I see some of this, and I'm not saying I'm excused from this like I've done all the work, but uh, they'll advocate presuppositionalism, and then they argue with other Christians about it. But then at the end of the day, when it comes to getting the facts on the ground and doing the research, sometimes the reform folks don't do as much work or effort, it seems like to me, in some instances, as uh, – our other brothers and sisters do, and they end up doing that. That's part of the heavy lifting, even if we disagree with on some mythological points. And my point is, I think more precepts need to also say, okay, now that we've established the context, I'll remind it. I'll remind you of it, but let's actually get into some of the facts of the matter. And that's where I think we can rely upon the work of <clears throat> Habermas and Lacona, for example, even though they're clearly not precept. That's my view, and I don't know, Anthony might say yeah. something different, but. Well, no, let, let me throw this in here. Van Til had this nice illustration. He, he does it better, but he, he talks about in any army in a battle, you always have your foot soldiers, you have your bigger artillery, uh, people with the big guns, you've got the tanks, and then, of course, you've, you've got the planes and then the big bombs and, and all the rest. And, and apologetics is very much like that. You know, you, you, you've got, uh, you know, definitely, if somebody's asking a question, for example, uh, how do we know that this manuscript of the Bible is reliable, right? This this particular book or what have you, we're we're necessarily going to have to get into a historical discussion. We're going to be have to we're going to have to talk about the facts. But the issue is when we start uh, reasoning about this, if the person is going to start using or employing assumptions that take for granted the falsity of the Christian worldview, we can't just let that slide. Uh, you know, if somebody assumes, for example, it's not possible for God to have preserved his word, because that would require God to do something in the case of the Bible that hasn't happened in the case of any other book, let's say. I'm just giving a, a somewhat of a limited illustration here. You know, that would assume something like God working a miracle, right? As some people would, would construe that. Uh, but in their view, miracles aren't possible. So at that point, a Christian would necessarily have to challenge that assumption, right? I mean, we can't just we can't just keep assuming that if we throw more facts at the person, that it's going to alter their conception of the Bible. Uh, no, it, it's kind of like uh, it, when somebody raises the objection against the Bible. Uh, look at this contradiction here. To me, these are the worst kinds of uh, discussions because all that's going to happen is you're going to answer that particular objection, and then what's going to happen? The person's going to say, oh, no, look at this contradiction then. And then you're going to answer that one. And they're going to say, look at this contradiction. And it's kind of like trying to make a bad tree good by sitting there and picking off the rotten fruit. Right. That's not going to effectively deal with a, a bad tree. You need to pull that thing up from the roots and, you know, establish a new tree. Uh, but um, all right. This was a uh, comment here. Agree or disagree? Aaron Larson says, "Presup equals jujitsu, and evidentialism equals boxing." <laughs> oh, that's I mean, that's not a bad uh, illustration. I mean, as far as illustrations go. And then uh, I, I, here, here's another illustration. I've always liked this one. Imagine that you walk out into a dark alley. It's two o'clock in the morning. 
and some mugger jumps out of the shadows and brandishes a knife and uh, tells you he a wants mugger, to vomit. A mugger brandishes a knife. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so he's like, he's uh, selling, that's for our. Yeah, he, yeah Mugger brandishes a knife. She, he's got his. Uh, he's selling <laughs> you a gumshoe from the fifties. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, so the guy's got a the, the, the guy's got a knife, and he tells you to give uh, him your wallet. Now you've got a loaded forty five, and so you you pull out your forty five, and and what are you going to do if this guy says to you, "I don't believe in the power of your forty five." Right. I, I don't think that that gun is uh, effective. I don't think it can hurt me and so forth. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to start exchanging evidence with him about the latest ballistics tests and uh, the power of this particular gun? Or are you going to unload and make a believer out of him? I would unload. I mean, I don't care if he believes in the power of my gun or not. Right. That I would say is is now that doesn't mean that a person who is in a similar circumstance couldn't use some martial arts and disarm the other guy. But all I'm observing is that that's not all that could be done, and maybe not even uh, the most important thing that could be done, especially if you've got a loaded weapon in your hand. All oh, right, well, are you, you, you're oh, using that illustration in reference to using the power of scripture and apologetic engagement. Is that where you? Yeah, yeah. I, I okay, because I don't, I don't know if ever I got I, it, but I, I'm not sure if I everyone. Think, I think the transcendental argument, which ultimately says that unless you believe the truth of God's revelation in Scripture about himself, about man, about the world, and therefore about all those relevant areas of philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, axiology, whatever, unless you accept this worldview, then nothing is intelligible. Uh, you're, you're completely you know, unloading on the person and saying that you know, you, you've, your worldview presents no threat to me. Uh, so... That, that was the point of the illustration. Sounds like you and I got a skit to do together. I could be the the Cretan brandishing a knife, and you can be <laughs> the, the guy with the 45, and we could have a great uh, great skit together. <laughs> uh, somebody mentioned that. Andrew Martin mentioned that I in, think, the, in the I, chat. Voc vocab, I think you could play a, a very good Cretan. Yeah, yeah, I'll be the, uh, <laughs> I'll be hey, the brigand. So, so at some point, I want to throw in here. I know I just talked, so I'll just throw this out. Maybe vocab will want to chime in on it. I've played a Cretan right. before, by the we've, way. We've we've used morality as our chief example here, but the idea applies to everything that we do to make human experience intelligible. If you want to, it's not just moral laws, but logical laws, laws of science or the uniformity of nature. Anything that is necessary as a principle of unity, meaning something we use to organize and make our experience intelligible, none of it is possible outside of a Christian worldview. And, and so, uh, in fact, let me give you this quote from Bertrand Russell real quick. This is from his book, Human Knowledge, Its, Scopes and Li its Scope and Limits. Russell said, now tell me if this sounds familiar. He says, if we are to hold that we know anything of the external world, remember, Bertrand Russell was a famous atheist philosopher. Okay? If we are to hold that we know anything of the external world, we must accept the canons of scientific knowledge. Whether an individual decides to accept or reject these canons is a purely personal affair, mm. not susceptible to argument. Mm. So, so here's Russell saying the same thing that Dillahunty said about morality. But most atheists would want to violently object to that sort of thing. But, but none of them are able to uh, mount up an argument against the consistent skepticism of people like David Hume and Bertrand Russell. Mm -hmm. David Hume and Bertrand Russell both ran a demolition job on all of the critical assumptions that underlie our belief in the ability to do science. Completely took away what's called the inductive principle, or the uniformity of nature, which is necessary to science, and, and, and just completely then uh, took all of the footing away from everyone who wants to say that we can know things scientifically. Now, we could talk more about that, but my point here was just to say, uh, this isn't the only thing, morality isn't the only problem uh, that this can be applied to. It applies to everything across the board. Uh, the unbeliever doesn't have anything uh, by which to understand his experience. Um, guys, Oh, uh, Can I give I, a quote on that? Go oh, ahead. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I, I was. Is yeah. It, I was, oh, go ahead. This is a quick quote mm -hmm. from Bonson and Van Til, uh, exactly what Anthony said. I'm not going to elaborate much beyond that. Just to say that oh, another way to state that, ladies and gentlemen, is that there is no fact that does not ultimately point back to God. Here's the way Van Til said it. 
So since he's sort of the founder of the system of thought, so you can see it. The best and only possible proof for the existence of such a God is that his existence is required for the uniformity of nature and for the coherence of all things in the world. Thus, there is absolutely certain proof for the existence of God and the truth of Christian theism. That's Van Til. Here's the way Bonson put it, slightly different. Upon analysis, all truth drives one to Christ. From beginning to end, man's reasoning about anything whatsoever, even reasoning about reason itself, is unintelligible or incoherent unless the truth of the Christian scriptures is presupposed. Any position contrary to the Christian one, therefore, must be seen as philosophically impossible. It cannot justify its beliefs or offer a worldview whose various elements comport with each other. In short, presuppositional apologetics are used for the truth of Christianity from the impossibility of the contrary. All right, I wanted to give a comment on uh, uniformity of nature because has, that's another phrase that people uh, people you know wouldn't tend to wouldn't tend to get. Um, and Hume, Hume, <laughs> Hume, and you know, famously in his in his dialogues concerning natural religion was uh, this was we didn't know nearly as much about the universe as we uh, as we do now back then. Um, so Hume would say, you know, how do you know if you go to a different world, there's not going to be different different rules there and different laws and stuff. Um, so just just think about that. What, why do we believe that you know the law of gravity, and these these various um, laws of nature, are going to be the same wherever we go in the universe? Uh, but more than that, why do you think uh, why do you think they're 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 never going to change? Right at some point in the future, and so you you eventually get down to what's called the problem of induction. Right, induction mm -hmm. is induction is different from deduction. Deduction is here's my first premise, here's my second premise, and from these two, the conclusion follows uh, inescapably. Um, that's not usually mm -hmm. how how science is done. Right, science is okay. We we ran this experiment, we got this result, so let's test it again. Oh, we did the experiment again, we got the same result, and we keep we keep repeating this experiment and so on. And we're we're getting the same results, or we've made this observation and we keep making the same observation. We conclude that if we were to do it again, then it would it would be the same. It would be the same in the future. So the problem of, of induction, which which was pointed out by Hume and others. Uh, goes like this. Uh, why do you think that just because something happened a thousand times already that it's not going to be completely different the next time? Um, and so what do you what do you say there? It's just, it's just kind of it's just kind of how we think, right? But we're willing to base all of science on that idea that 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 there's a there's a kind of underlying consistency to the entire universe. Um, and we have complete confidence in that. Again, all of science is based in part on on that assumption there, that it's happened that way in the past, it'll happen that way in the future. Why do you think that because something happened a certain way in the past, that it's going to happen a certain way in the future? What's your basis for accepting that claim? That the, you know, the way it happened in the past is the way it's going to happen in the future. What's your basis for thinking that? The only possible defense you could have of that claim uh, if you were to just try and defend that claim scientifically, would be to say, well, I've used that method in that method of inference in the past, yep. and it's always worked out. You have and to therefore, to the past. yeah, you're using your it's circular, right? It's circular. Mm -hmm. So you'd be you in other words, you'd be using the principle that's being called into question in order to defend the principle that's being called into question. Does everyone understand that? If you say, hey, why do I believe that th just because this thing happened a thousand times that the future is going to be the same? If you were to try and defend your your underlying principle of reasoning, you'd say, "Well, I tried. I used that principle a thousand times, assuming that the way the past was, the future would be, and it kept happening that way. And so, I really, really trust that principle. My principle's been proven. You're just assuming the principle. And, and the, the the guy the guys who were pointing out this problem, were, the skeptics who were pointing out this problem, were just it's just the way we think. It's just the way. It's not something you can you can defend. It's just the way we think." But notice, if you want to say that the way we're thinking is correct, that's where you get to what's called the uniformity of nature. You're, you, you've got an assumption that these things aren't going to change and yeah. that there's un some underlying ground that is keeping uh, nature and reality uniform. And so notice mm -hmm. that that's presupposed in all of science and in all of our reasoning and in all of our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and so, yeah, something to think yeah. about, but it's not something that we normally bring to the surface. There are all these things. And here's the idea. 
There are all these things that of about reasoning and logic and everything else that we just take for granted. We never yeah. question the status of those beliefs, and yet they're all fundamental to all of our reasoning, and yet those things make sense given the existence of God, but not other worldviews. Go ahead. And I'll let Anthony, I'll let you go. I just want to read one Bible verse that comports what, what you're just saying, David. That idea that uniformity of nature, I think you can even find places where it's uh, clearly attested in Scripture. For example, when Yahweh's speaking to Noah as part of the Noahic a covenant after the flood subsided in Genesis 8, uh, he even makes a promise where he speaks of, while the earth remains, sea time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day and night shall not cease. It's a guarantee, it's a promise that God says that there will be uniformity in nature. Because I asked an atheist one time, you know, why do you assume that the sun will rise tomorrow? And he said, well, it's been that way for the past 33 years. So you're uh, appealing to the past to justify the future. But there's a there's a massive problem there. There's really no reason to assume that. And yet all of scientific all of our scientific enterprises are predicated upon that very idea. So not just science, but the philosophy of science, the undergirding realities that make science possible, we have, we want to say, okay, what about those? And so this is very important, very big stuff. It's in, um, it's it's beautiful to see, then gives us a better understanding of miracles, because miracles are just simply God interacting with his creation in a less regular way than he regularly does. He's not contravening or breaking some moral uh, some natural law out there because he indeed is the center who holds it all together and so i think that it flows together in a complete way for us to also understand then what is a miracle anthony yeah so here i just throw in basically it's the christian doctrines of creation and providence we believe that god yeah. created and, and upholds and governs the world and there are innumerable passages that speak to that Scripture speaks of Christ upholding all things by the word of his power in mm -hmm. Hebrews 1. Colossians 1 says that in him all things subsist or are held together. So you have this idea very clearly in Scripture. And this is why, by the way, it shouldn't be any surprise that science itself was a product of the Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. Other societies kind of limped along. They had this natural impulse, I think. You know, you do see... Uh, certain things happening in other cultures. I'm not pretending that they're not made in the image of God, they didn't contribute to civilization and so forth. But inevitably, what always happened in these societies is that uh, science was always stillborn, or uh, if there was any movement, it was quickly snuffed out, because there just wasn't a worldview within which science really made any sense. And so it, it's simply a historical fact that it was mm -hmm. Christians who were at the forefront of the what we now think of as, as science. Uh, and all, in fact, most of the major disciplines were founded by Christians. And here, it doesn't even uh, require that we say that every person who was there and, and, and uh, involved in uh, initiating this whole project uh, was a Christian. They were still part of a Christian cultural milieu where those ideas still influenced people's thinking. Uh, th and they, so, were, they, they were all Christian of one variety or another. They were all Protestant, yeah. Catholic, or heretical. Uh, but yeah, yeah non-trinitarian. Yeah, no, like yeah, there were no. Yeah, there were no. There were no atheists. There were no any other religion. It was all. Uh, and if you read, yeah, if you read Isaac category. Newton, Isaac Newton's stuff is chock full of that idea. And sometimes there are certain problems in science that uh, would come about, and where uh, there would be people who would seek answers because they knew there had to be a rational explanation. They knew it would be able to be solved because there's a, there's a guarantee of a logic to the universe. And you just don't have that if you have random deities controlling different elements at their own arbitrary will. And you don't have that if you have no no reason for regularity of, of nature, which is really the created order, you know, upon some atheistic under, misunderstanding. You, you don't have that guarantee. You don't have that at the bottom of it. So, you know, atheists will wield science against a Christian, not not even taking into account how is this – this reality of science even made possible in the first place. And there's some good books on it. Jonathan Sarfati's written on it. There's another book called The Genesis of Science that is helpful. And Richard Carey has tried to respond to some of those, but he's responded back too. And I think it's helpful. But what Anthony said is true, and especially in China, where there was a lot of things that were very sciencey, but the overall worldview mentality didn't support the, the a totalizing scientific revolution uh, late, that you would see later on and during the, the, the medieval and modern era. Um, yeah, and what what you see in those Eastern religions, for example, uh, you know, the idea that all reality is one and distinctions are an illusion, all is Maya or what have you, 
uh, there, there's no world really to study, that, and there's no person mm-hmm, to study mm-hmm. it. I mean, all of that presupposes distinctions. Mm-hmm. I remember many years ago, and this is another illustration that I hope will help people, but many years ago I was talking to a guy, a friend would usually call me over to his house whenever he had somebody there he was uh, evangelizing because he wanted me to be the bad guy, and that way his neighbor wouldn't be upset with him, so I'd go over and do the dirty work. I'd play bad cop, but I, I went over there, and I was talking with the guy, and, and he basically espoused a Eastern view of the world. Reality is one, and a lot of our problems arise from assuming distinctions, you know, all of these Western ideas and so forth. And and so uh, as, he's, as he's talking to me, and then I start telling him about the Christian view, I told him about God and creation, man rebelling against God and being a sinner and needing a savior. All of a sudden, he started getting really upset. So he started, you know, throwing these epithets at me, calling me names and so forth. And I said, wait a minute. I said, on your worldview, there's no real distinction between me and you. So whatever you say about me goes back to the old childhood, you know, uh, right, the, the old response bounces off me and sticks on you. You can't ultimately say anything about me that's not true about you on a conception of the world that says there's no fundamental distinctions. I said, and furthermore, because he was also calling me intolerant and bigoted and so forth, I said, you're assuming a distinction between a view that's not t- intolerant and bigoted. Uh, so you're again assuming distinctions. And, and, and I just kept up with this sort of thing, just pressing him on his underlying assumption uh, which he couldn't mm-hmm. live with, and he, and he got upset, and he, and he got up, and he started to go across the street, and I had to give one parting shot, and I said, make sure you look both ways before crossing the street. You don't want to become one with the, the, the pavement. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so he didn't like me anymore. But it's, it's an example, well, and that's why that's science— that's good. That's a reductio yeah. ad absurdum. That's a big yeah. part of Vantillian apologetics is a polemic where you run an internal critique on the system, and in a manner of speaking— Answer the fool according to his folly, meaning you so you you act as if what they're saying is legitimately real. It's like, okay, if that's really how it is, then because usually people don't want to deal with what their worldview played out really looks like. And that's why, you know, Hume's not perfect, and I'm no expert on Hume, but I like him better than uh, a lot of the modern internet atheists because it seems like Hume, to a certain extent, was willing to look down the black void and the empty, vapid nature that was at the root of atheism. And I read one quote when he said when he pondered these things, such as uh, one time he was pondering why cause and effect even is a reality in our universe. When you hit one billiard ball, why, 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 oh, yeah, he said, yeah, exactly. So Anthony has a quote. He says, I just, I I just basically relieve my mind by going and playing a a game of backgammon. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like, I can't figure it out. You know, I don't just go play some mario kart you know? yeah um no i guys i i i really like hume if he uh, especially i don't know why atheists think that uh hume is on their side in the in his dialogues considering uh in his dialogues concerning natural religion because he blasts the design argument so much in there and then defends the argument the argument from evil and then so they love those parts they ignore the part at the end of the character when the the, the uh, at the end of the dialogues when when uh, the character Philo says no I was just kind of joke I was just kind of joking about all that stuff with the with the design with the design argument of course of course this points to a designer they kind of ignore the point of Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion what what Hume's point there was is he's saying watch what theists do so this is Hume Hume's writing he says watch what theists do They'll tell us, go with the evidence when it's convenient to them. But then if we start using evidence against them, they start becoming skeptics. And I'm trying to show you that you're not being consistent. And so he starts saying uh, he has one character pointing out all the design in nature and another guy playing skeptic. Oh, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe this caused the apparent design. And the guy who's, who's defending design keeps hammering at home. How can you ignore this? How can you ignore all, the, all of this design? And uh, the, the skeptic is, is playing skeptic the entire time, saying he can explain it other ways. And then they get to the evidence from evil, and, he, and now Philo is saying, look at all, look at all of this uh, evil in the world. Look at all of this evil. And the theist is saying, oh, but maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. Maybe this accounts for it. Maybe that accounts for it. And so he's pointing out that you're only telling me to go with the evidence when it's convenient for you. And so that's when, that's when he says, you know, of, cor- of course the design in the world points to a, points to a, points to a designer. But his point is, because of all the evil and suffering in the world, it doesn't point to a designer that cares all that much about us. Uh, so the, the appropriate conclusion to draw from what you see around you is that there's a designer, a creator, 
who doesn't care much about us. And so that's the point there. But notice that's that's certainly not atheism. That would be a that would be a kind of deism minus the benevolence that that, that is common to to most deists. Um, and so that but notice the entire the entire thing was be consistent in your methodology. And that's the that's the sort of thing where I can look at Hume and go. Amen. Of course, be consistent in your methodology. Now, Christians, you need to be able to come up with an answer about that of why you don't think that, uh, you know, the universe points to an indifferent uh, creator, but the call for consistency and methodology. Amen. I mean, that is a that is a, a massive slam on atheists, if I ever saw one um, on the issue of uh, of science and so on. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you could you could classify my uh my opening statement, my main argument in my debate with Michael Shermer as a kind of like historical presuppositionalist argument, because my argument was based on the, and it's funny because you could give, you could give tons of different arguments for the existence of God. I sometimes like to come right at my opponent's greatest strength if he has one. And Michael Shermer's PhD is in the history of science. So I thought to myself, cool, I'll give my entire opening statement on the history of science as my, as my, argument. And so I came out and acknowledged, of course, you had scientific developments and, uh, you know, scientific, uh, you know, mainly technological developments and so on um, in the history of humanity. But you had nothing that was like a revolution until you got to Christian Europe. And basically the period from Copernicus to Newton, those, those 200 years or so, that's the period classified as the scientific revolution, where people went from knowing very, very little to having the big, the big understanding of almost of almost everything in that little two-century uh, period, and um, it, it's it's basically when you look at their writings again, every single person involved in the scientific revolution was a Christian of one variety uh, or another, and if you look at their writings on why they were concluding all this stuff, one they believed that the universe has an intelligent creator, that there is a mind and an architect behind everything. That is a common symbol to use like little architectural tools uh, in their descriptions of, of what God is doing. So they believed that there's a creator who is using laws to work everything, he's using his mind and he's a creator and so on. So they believe that. Notice, you have to believe that before you get started. You're not going to go out and try and figure out the fundamental laws of nature unless you already believe that the universe is governed by these neat little laws, right? You keep in mind, you don't know them. You don't know these, you don't know, you don't know the law of gravity. You have no idea what that little equation is. Why would you think that if I drop this bottle, it's going to follow an equation? It's going to obey an equation. What, why, what the, how, how would a bottle know how to obey an equation? It doesn't make any sense, right? These guys believed it before they went out. And the reason you have to believe it first is you have to dedicate your entire life to going out and figuring these things out. You have to dedicate your entire life. You have to say, guys, I'm going to spend the next 10 years gathering data so that I can try and figure out an equation based on all that stuff, right? You don't do that unless you're already convinced that it, that, that sort of thing is out there. So one, they had to believe that the universe is this sort of thing that can be understood, that is law-like at the bottom right? Uh, two, they had to believe that they're the kinds of things that can figure it out, right? That they have the intellectual capacity to go there, go through all the data, and actually figure out those laws that God is using to govern the universe. They have to believe that ahead of time, because you could believe that the universe is, is run by all these laws. If you don't believe that you're the kind of thing that can actually go there and figure it out, you're not going start to the, start the project either. And finally, they believed that it was good to do that that it's something good to know how God is running the universe. Notice, you could say, yeah, there's laws out there, and yeah, I could figure it out, but why? Why would I do that rather than something else? You have to believe that, that understanding this is all good. And if you look at their writings, they viewed it as a kind of worship. They viewed themselves as, as trying to use the, their, the image of God in themselves to become increasingly more and more like God by understanding how he's doing things. And they said, they called it a kind of worship that they're doing. Again, this is all of the people who were involved in the scientific revolution. All of them were like this. Notice, of the three elements that you need to get the scientific revolution off the ground, not none of it makes sense on atheism. None of that makes sense at all. It does not make sense. If you didn't know ahead of time that the universe is run, governed by all these little laws and all you were was an atheist, would you think the universe is governed by all these little equations and that all the every particle around you, everything around you, it's all following equations? It wouldn't, it wouldn't make any sense. Uh, would you think that you're the kind of thing that can figure that out? If you're an atheist and you believe that 
um, that your abilities, all your reasoning abilities, your perception abilities were just, you know, they were selected because they helped find food or a mate? Would you think that you can figure out the truths of the universe? No, you wouldn't think that for a second. So you would never even try. And, and three, why would you think that it's good? Why would you think that that sort of thing is good? And so if atheism were at the helm, the scientific revolution would never have happened. And yet atheists are the ones who think that science is on their side. Every scientific experiment ever performed is only confirmation of the Christian view and refutation of the atheist view. All of science confirms the Christ Christian theism and uh, completely undermines and destroys atheism. Atheists don't, can't get their minds around that. And so what we have, not just here, but in morality, uh, everything else, atheism, I want to say, is parasitic right? It's like a parasite. It's like, it's like a lamprey attached to a shark and the shark is, Hey, this could be my illustration, Anthony, right? You got the, you got the sitting on the, you got the sitting on the, you know, sitting on the lap to smack. And then, uh, I think CS Lewis was, uh, sitting on a branch and cutting it off or something like that. But, uh, atheism is like a lamprey stuck in the side of a shark and the shark's swimming through the water and the lamprey's going, look how fast I'm swimming. You know what I mean? It's, you're not the one going along, right? You're not the one going along. That's theism carrying everything. You're just a lamprey sucking the blood out of the side of the thing. That's my example. All right. I talked for a long time, but I wanted to, wanted to get that in there. All right, guys, what, what do you want? What do you want? What do you got? Well, that's uh, good stuff, Anthony. <laughs> no, it looks like you're about to say something. I can always say something. No, uh, like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I can say something. So, so let me let, let me actually key in off of a few things that David threw in there, uh, sort of tied in with with science. He talked about mathematics and the applicability of mathematical notions to the world. But notice notice something here: mathematics are not concrete physical things, right? Uh, the, the principles of mathematics, the laws of mathematics, numbers and so forth, those aren't concrete particular things. They're abstractions, right? At least uh, we, we might describe them that way, at least initially. We might want a more robust uh, explanation of that. But at least at this point, we know that they're not the same things that we're studying uh, when we're looking at the natural world. And so the question is, why do they have uh, any relevance to the contingent changing facts of experience? The, the principles of mathematics are universal. They're abstract. They're not material. And they're not changing. So what do these two things have to do with each other? Why, why do we, we try and relate these two things? It's like trying to relate oil and water unless you believe that mathematical principles are a reflection of the way God thinks and expects us to think, by the way. And, and, and therefore, they apply to the world because God is the one who is, is the source of mathematics, is creating and governing the world in accordance with his own rational character. That's why these two things relate. But if you if you take God out of the picture, then what you're uh, here's another Vantillian illustration. He says it's like trying to string beads without holes onto a string without ends. You know, you've got these discrete facts and and these principles of unity that have two fundamentally different sets of characteristics. They have nothing to do with each other, unless you're saying that these two things are alike from God. And God is governing the world in accordance with uh, his own rational character and so forth. That's why logic applies to the world. That's why mathematics applies to the world. But on atheism, you don't have such an accounting. And I think you know that formulation is similar to the transcendental argument for God's existence, which is sort of a— uh, that's not a methodology. That's a particular argument, the transcendental argument for— although using transcendentals, of course, is a— sort of part of the methodology, but the actual transcendental argument from God's existence, uh, which, you know, utilizes the laws of logic or logical absolutes, um, is it, formulated in a similar similar way. For example, you might say logical absolutes exist. Logical absolutes are conceptual by their very nature, just like what Anthony was saying. You know, if you write the number two on a chalkboard and then erase it, the number two doesn't disappear. That's one way that's helpful for me to think about it. And so that helps you see that they're not dependent upon space, time, anything physical or humans themselves, you know. And so one way to think about that is, you know, could you hand someone a law of logic or could you trip over a law of logic? The answer, of course, is no. People kind of laugh if they even think about that. They realize the, there's a mismatch there. So um, how are they – how would then would they be the product of a physical universe? How would that be? Because if the physical universe disappeared – wouldn't it be the case that logical absolutes would still be here? Yeah, they'd still be true. 
and they're not the product of human minds because you know a human mind from a human each one's different they're they're not absolute and they they even change so how could that be the case but they're always true everywhere they're universal they're not dependent upon human minds they're not contingent in that way so then what's sort of at the bottom of them and that's where you have either the bottom of a universe something physical or something mental and that's where we say the laws of logic in essence are a mirror of god's own thought if properly utilized uh, so you have to have an absolutely transcendent mind uh, authoring them in a sense and that's that's god and so you say okay uh then what do you, where do you go from there? Because can any other worldview get you the laws of logic? The very thing that every debate depends upon that, you know, you know, the math itself is, is a reflection of all these kinds of things. When you, you know, evidence, how you weigh evidence, all that stuff, all that stuff can't do without the laws of logic, which are basically, um, proper ways to think about things. You know, that's that's not a very precise definition. But you look and you say the Christian worldview. And the classic example of this being played out in a debate is, of course, with Greg Bonson and Gordon Stein. And there's a famous exchange during one of the cross-examinations where you can hear it. And, you know, everything's aren't, everything's not so simple and clean. And notice a lot of our examples have had to deal primarily with atheism. I do feel like... Um, that's sort of the best place to go because the contrast is so strong. But there does need to be consistent work done in regards to what is a presuppositional approach to Hebrew Israelites and Islam and things of that nature look like as well. We haven't done a whole lot of that here today. And indeed, uh, in, 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 and to a certain extent, a lot of presuppositionalists haven't done a whole lot of that themselves. And so uh, there's more to be said about it, you know what I'm saying? And so that's why I think— um, we can get together. You know, I don't I don't like to waste my time fighting with people who don't agree with any version of presuppositionalism. I, I get it. I'll have a discussion about it. But people get really emotional about these things. I'm not going around trying to convert everybody to this and that. I'm just explaining, OK, here's why I try to approach things the way I do. I believe it's biblical and scriptural. And by God's grace, Anthony uh, and I agree on that even though I'm a little softer than he is. And David, you know, he's just, he's the worst of all because he doesn't want to take a position. So he's just like, you know, <laughs> well, I agree with you guys, but then the next day he's talking to some haters. So, you know, it is what it is. Well, if we, uh, if we accept that, uh, if we accept that presuppositional apologetics is jujitsu and that um, evidentialism is boxing, and I just say, man, why not do MMA? You know what I mean? Let's do MMA. Just use it all, right? <laughs> Master all the styles and use them all in a, you know, in a flurry. So you got, see, you guys are like Hoist Gracie. You know what I mean? You're like one-dimensional Hoist Gracie. <laughs> well, no, I no, do see, believe in a, see, I believe is, in a more integrative approach. I do believe in a more integrative yeah. approach, well, which a lot of this, presuppers don't agree with. Well, and and that's when you say a lot of, and I, I mean, I don't know who you who you mean, but. Uh, certainly I can think of examples too, but then I don't think that represents the best that Van Til had to offer. But one thing that people don't realize is that Van Til was one of the co-founders of Westminster Seminary along with the, the late great J. Gresham Machen, who was at the forefront of defending Orthodox Christianity against the encroaching theological liberalism uh, that was afoot at the time. Uh, they were defending, among other things, the fundamentals of the faith, but not limited to that, but things like the bodily resurrection of Christ, uh, the inspiration and authority of Scripture, over against uh, those liberal Christians who were saying, these aren't things that we need to believe as Christians, which of course isn't Christianity at all. But my my point in bringing that up is that J. Gresham Machen was a stalwart uh, in the use of evidences for the truth of Christianity. And Van Til worked side by side with him. He didn't think that his method was contrary to, to Machen's. Uh, Van Til was not opposed to the evidence. He just recognized that a person has to present the evidence in a way that's faithful to God, that's faithful to what Scripture says, faithful to what the Bible says is true about the natural man, that he is not neutral, he's not approaching the evidence intending to le follow it wherever it leads, he's trying to avoid the God of Scripture, you know, saying that, I remember a long time ago, and, uh, you know, just the uh, a long time ago I was talking to this person who was a uh, openly homosexual individual, and uh, he said to me, uh, you know, I tried, I tried, I tried uh, to find proof for God's existence. Now, it was apparent to me in the course of the conversation uh, that this person did not want to give up their lifestyle, and that was a major roadblock for this person concluding that God existed. 
And so at one point in the conversation, we remained friends. You know, we're still friends. We, we don't talk much. But uh, at one point I said to this person, just to be blunt and frank, I said, you were looking for God about as much as you were looking for the girl of your dreams. And at that, at that he, <laughs> he uh, you know, he, he kind of lost it for a minute. But but my point is, that's it's like saying that a criminal is looking for the police. A criminal is not looking for the police. Unbelievers are not trying to find the evidence uh, for God's existence. They're trying to suppress it. And so you have to at some point say, you know, the gig is up. I'm not going to let you even pretend that you're able to interpret any evidence as long as you're not going to accept the evidence for what it is. And so uh, there, there is uh, definitely a reason to use evidence and a place for using evidence, but but always in a manner that is consistent with the, the claims of God on men, that he made them, he owns all the facts, and that his revelation is necessary to interpret the facts. Mm-hmm. Um. All right, uh, you guys got something else you want to add on presuppositional apologetics before we uh, jump into some questions? One last thing maybe is that uh, I think of it along these lines where Jesus says that the wise man builds his house upon the rock and the foolish man, you know, is building his house upon sand. I think there's application for that here. I'm not saying that Jesus was like, hey, this is secretly my proof text for presuppositionalism when he's laying out that verse, but I think it's overarching to to all things. And so that being said, part of what I think a goal should be for a, for a, a biblical presuppositionalist, especially as they engage in evangelism, is to try to gracefully show relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, that whoever the unbeliever is, because an, a Muslim is a, an ultimately an unbeliever, according to the biblical understanding, because it bifurcates the world. So the Muslim may say, well, no, I, but biblically speaking, they're an unbeliever, because they don't believe what the Bible says about God, nor Jesus, or about salvation. Showing the unbeliever gracefully, by God's grace, you right now are standing upon sand. It's shifting. It's sinking. Because the Muslim is doing dawah, they're inviting you over, and you're saying, whoa, whoa, I I don't want to jump onto a place where the house is built upon sand. And what we're trying to show is, look, Christ is the rock. The Christian worldview can support all these things that you want, whether it's morality or the basis to do science, uh, whatever it is, it, it comports. And we're saying, come over to stand upon the rock. Sometimes that project entails sort of a deconstruction process that doesn't always look very pretty, and this is where I think presuppositionalists have to be careful, and all of us can make human mistakes, because part of it is is polemical against the the inadequacies of any given non-Christian worldview, and trying to show, nah, this is sand, it's shifting sand, it's sticky sand. Come to the rock who is Christ, who can support uh, this through you through the storms, even if the storm would be questions about metaphysics and ontology and epistemology. <laughs> I'm ready for questions now. Um, oh, wait, we uh, th- there, w- there was a question I said we wanted to get to. Uh, suppose, suppose I come to you and I say, Why should I believe in? God, uh, what would be your short presuppositional response? Vocab? Uh, oh, no, he said short, so maybe he wanted me to answer. Right, no, 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 be- because because I, I'm saying if I <laughs> if if I were to, like obviously if I were to go to uh, William Lane Craig or someone you know mm-hmm. with with that perspective on apologetics, I'm going to get, you know, the Kalam cosmological argument, then something uh, from fine tuning of the universe. Um, then, you know, maybe a moral argument, maybe something like that. But uh, what would, what would you say? Yeah. So, so for me, I actually, I like when I can do it, you, you can't always determine certain things about a conversation, but I like your approach when you mentioned that uh, when, when you went into the debate, I think it was with Shermer uh, you decided to focus on the history of science. Uh, in my view, since I think everything presupposes the truth of Christianity in order for it to be intelligible, 
Uh, and, and what I ultimately want to do with an unbeliever is try and show that what they take to be the most precious thing or the most reliable thing as, as far as knowing things about the world and so forth, uh, I, I want to go right after that. I want to talk about that. So if I find out that somebody is a cosmetologist, uh, you know, a beautician, whatever, uh, I'm going to say, hey, tell me about what you do. And then I'm going to start unraveling uh you know, the, the whole idea of that as being possible in, in light of a non-Christian worldview. Uh, so if so if I met a, a mathematician, I, I'd ask him, you know, how, how do you account for counting, right? How, how do you make sense out of how we can uh, count and, and how math and mathematical principles apply to the world? Uh, if it's a scientist, I'm going to say, how do you account for induction or the uniformity of nature? Uh, if it's a logician, I'd say, how do you account for logic? Uh, it really doesn't matter what it is. Uh, if somebody says, uh, the other day I was watching these uh, videos on YouTube and there was this, uh, this girl who was uh, swimming with like this 30 foot shark. And then she was on the news because they thought it was the biggest shark that anyone had ever seen before. And, uh, she was an activist for, for, for sharks and, and, uh, you know, defending nature and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with uh, the extent to the, uh, that she goes to, but I mean, when I was watching that, I remember thinking, you know, oftentimes what unbelievers are doing when they want to make other things important is they try and personalize them, right? They, they often raise these things to the level of man. Uh, but really, on a non-Christian view, there's no reason to say that everything should be viewed as equal to man in the sense of bringing it up here. Rather, I would want to say that if everything is equal, then we need to bring man down here and say everything is equally worthless. Man has no dignity, and not, neither do the animals, as, as opposed to saying that animals and man both have dignity. Um, I don't know if that gets uh, at what you're thinking, but I mean, I, I'm just saying that uh, I just try and find whatever is important to a person and then try and uh, dissect it and say, you know, ultimately that assumes my God in order for it to be intelligible. All right. Now, follow up. Suppose it was, let's say, a mathematician and you said, uh, you know, what do you, you know, what's the foundation of mathematics and so on? He says, obviously, Allah. That's why I say Allahu Akbar and I'll do jihad on you if you uh, question me. Uh, then, what do you say I then? Point out that I point out that Allah can't count according to his own Quran. He can't tell whether he created in six days or eight days. Uh, when he talks about dividing the inheritance, Allah can't even get simple fractions straight. Allah, uh, you know, in the Quran, he breaks it down. And when you go on and do the figures, you see that uh, actually it doesn't work out. You can't ultimately divide things the way that Allah suggested. Uh, but it's even more basic than that. It's not just that Allah does a terrible job of, of uh, doing basic math in the Quran. It's that Allah's own character isn't consistent with the principles of mathematics or the whole idea that the world is being governed uh, by that kind of a god. Uh, it, there, are, there are various factions of Islam, so it would take a lot more time to work through all of them. But uh, many versions of Islam describe Allah in a voluntarist sense, meaning that Allah just does whatever he does arbitrarily. Uh, and so, and you get uh, reasons for that from the Quran when you see Allah constantly changing his mind, right? Allah is as fickle as they come as far as deities are concerned. He's more fickle than the ancient pagan gods worshipped by the Greeks and Romans and, and all the rest. Uh, Allah constantly abrogates his own revelations, changes his mind on whether or not Muhammad could have uh, four wives or more, uh, whether or not his followers could drink or not, whether or not his followers could engage in war or not. Allah was constantly changing his mind. And that's because, as at least a certain uh, version of Muslims would say, Allah is completely free and he has no nature or essence in terms of which he acts in a consistent fashion. It's complete voluntarism. And actually, by the way, just, just to throw out here, uh, an evidentialist by the name of Norman Geisler and Abdul Salih, both of them are evidentialists, wrote a great book on Islam that I read many years ago, and, and they have a great discussion of this, where they're, where they're pointing this out. Uh, so even this observation isn't simply a presuppositionalist observation, but it does work into the presuppositionalist approach. It's not just that you need God to account for things, you need a particular God to do so. You need a God who's consistent, who has a specific character, always acts in accordance with his character, a God who is a promise-making and promise-keeping God, a, a God who makes covenant and keeps them and doesn't break them, who doesn't say, you know, break the treaties with the idolaters like he does in Romans, or, uh, excuse me, Surah 9. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I said uh, Romans nine instead of Surah nine. So uh, Allah. It's, does a, not Freud, it's a Freudian slip. You admitting the truth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Allah Akbar. <laughs> so 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 my observation is so now now here let me just make one further observation. It, it's not true that most of the world's religions are, you know, that Christianity is just one more theistic religion. There, there really aren't many religions that have a belief in an absolute personal God. Uh, the, the vast majority of religions in the world either have, if they have personal gods, they're not absolute. And if they have an absolute, it's not personal. It's really limited to the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's only in Judeo-Christian theism that you get this idea of an absolute personal God. But inasmuch as both Judaism, post-Christian Judaism, and Islam depart from biblical revelation, their ability to account for these things ends up breaking down. And so uh, what Vocab was talking about, about needing to do more work, is certainly true. We need to do that. But it's not like it's it's uh, something that can't be done or uh, that nothing's been done. Certainly, there uh, something has been done, and uh, I'm hoping to do a bit more of that in my upcoming debate with Shabir in September. So, uh, Shabir, get ready for the nuclear argument against Islam. You don't know there's going to be a debate. You got coronavirus, man. I know. I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. Whoa. Why did uh why did vocab di oh vocab disappeared? Oh gosh, what happened? <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> uh, but how does he get get back in? Because um oh I don't know. And how how am I still on? Because he called me first. Actually, I see his name still. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he had something to do. All right. Uh, let's go to a couple questions here. Um. Uh. We'll go through the, well, let's just look through the super chats. Riaz Qureshi said, this is my Jizya payment. Make sure it gets to Mecca. They need it now. Uh, Worth Dying For said, if Cain, here's a question for you, reformed man. If Cain, by Calvinist definition, could not respond to God, why did God warn him and tell him that if he did well, he would be accepted? According to Calvinism, God must have lied. What do you think about that? No, no. In the first place, as a Calvinist, I believe if Cain had done well, then he would have been accepted. I don't deny that. The question is, could Cain have done well? And here, you, you're asking also the question, uh, why would God command Cain to do something he can't do? Well, the fact of the matter is, Scripture is full of the commands that we can't do, because man is a fallen creature. Uh, so the argument doesn't really work. Scripture says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Unless you're a perfectionist, then you don't believe that people can keep that command because no person is perfect. And if you are a perfectionist, then I'd point out you're contradicting Scripture. According to Scripture, there's not a righteous man on earth who always does what's right and never sins, Ecclesiastes 7.29. So there's no objection there to Calvinism. Uh, it's, just, it's just a failure to really understand Calvinism. All right. Um Aaron Larson said, uh, Anthony's 45 equals Judgment Day. You know what that means? I'm 45 years old, but uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, I, uh, do do I don't know what that means either. Anyone know what that means? said, Anthony's, Anthony's 45 equals Judgment Day. Is that a Christian asking that? I don't know. Oh, I'm assuming. Well, yeah. Maybe it's a threat. <laughs> <laughs> um. Cheryl R. says, why does vocab... Oh, oh, oh 45. The, the oh, okay, 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 okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, Cheryl R. says, uh, why does vocab always have to be the clown um, <laughs> or the, uh, <laughs> the, the the Muhammad? Uh, I, should, I think she's talking about videos. Um, yeah, he doesn't. Sometimes he plays Donald Trump and some some other parts, but uh, he's, just, <laughs> he's just good at being a, a total clown. Yeah. yeah, he's a good actor too, though. Um, Jun Kim said, uh, hope you got my email. God bless you all. Uh, Eddie Vasquez says $5 towards pizza. God bless. Yes, I will have pizza here in a couple days. Um, uh, MJ Jackson says inductive presuppositionalism is better. You know what that is? Uh, not per se. Uh, I mean, I, I could guess, but I'm not certain. I don't know of anything that goes by that label. But there are different versions of presuppositionalism. Uh, just to throw out some names, E.J. Carnell had a particular view of presuppositionalism. Vocab mentioned Francis Schaeffer, who had his own version. Uh, Gordon Clark had his version of presuppositionalism. And then you have Van Til. 
Um, so there, there are different ways that people have uh, gone with some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have Primus81, Super Chat, no comment though. Uh, Benjamin Handelman said, new Calvin... <laughs> it's the new Calvinism acronym. So I said you need a tougher one. Pitbull. All right, ready? Is this, is this, vo is this vocab coming back? Yeah, but this is on my phone. This is on the wrong thing. Uh, okay. Well, we so can we can we can we can just have your voice. Are you going to be able um, to get? Are you are you going to get, be able to get video up? If not, I will take your picture off there, and we can have your voice on. We're up oh, there. You go. Yeah, but it's it's from my phone now. It's fine. We're not. Why. We're just doing some questions that we're getting off there, okay. so you're fine, and we hear you fine, so you're good. All right. Well, all right, my right. video's up too. If you can now. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, Benjamin Handelman says, the new Calvinism acronym, you got the new one here now, vocab, is Pit Bull, Perseverance of the Saints, Irresistible Grace, Total Depravity, Beard, <laughs> Unconditional Election, and Limited Atonement. See, that's way that's way tougher. You would get way more people <laughs> agreeing with you with so something like that than with your tulip stuff. <laughs> I think you might be onto something. I'm telling you, if you use that, you're gonna, you guys, are gonna, gonna smash it, man. You're gonna smash it. <laughs> um, Mr. Phil Fox said this super chat is a pick me up for Vocab Malone, who just got his ice cream cone slapped out of his hand, figuratively. Ha 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 ha! Thanks for all of your ministries. Did you get your ice cream cone slapped out of your hand, Vocab? Well, I guess because I got kicked off. Uh, I don't know what happened, man. No, that was it, it was it was earlier than that. I don't know what happened either. Yeah. But uh Mr. Phil Fox said he uh he gave twenty bucks for you. Um uh Otis Show, Otis Show said, Hi David and all, can you explain this to me? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So guys, what does that mean? Yeah, the, the quick answer is it doesn't say work for your salvation, it says work out your salvation. So it assumes that a person already has it. And here it's important to remember that salvation in Scripture is a broader term than simply forgiveness of sins. Uh, when man fell, man not only incurred guilt for his sins and therefore liability to punishment, he also became corrupt. So man is both guilty and corrupt. He is liable to judgment, to death, uh, before God, and he also lacks inwardly that righteousness that he originally had, and is now characterized by being sinful. So what Christ is doing, uh, and, and by the Spirit as well, is not just that he came to die for our sins and take away our guilt, but he also, as a consequence of his redemptive labors, received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, whom he has poured out now upon his people. And then the Spirit then is now conforming us to that righteousness uh, that we already have in Christ before God. So it's not just justification, but sanctification. Christ has legally secured our standing before God, but now he's also transforming us into his image. So that's what it means to work out your salvation. You've been saved by Christ. Now go and seek to live out the implications of that. Grow in holiness. Grow in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Karis, S-G-G-E-K-T, says, Ew, Calvinists, don't you have icons to be mad at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still mad about icons. Ooh, uh, Cal hey, let me repeat. Ooh, Calvinists, don't you have icons to be mad at? Yes. <laughs> well, I, I think it's ironic. Uh, the person's name is Karis. I can't see how it's spelt on the screen, but if it's the Greek word for grace, then uh, ironic to hear. No, nope, it's K. It's K. A it's K A R S. Oh, okay. K A R A S. Yep. I, yeah, okay. I'm still mad. My answer is I'm still mad about icons. Now, I'm not going to go in and to any uh, Orthodox church and forcibly remove them like some of those like, wild iconoclastic like, parties of, you coward. of yesteryear. Of yesteryear. <laughs> but I still think they're a problem. I, I have many Eastern Orthodox, Byzantine, uh, you know, Oriental Orthodox friends. Um, so I certainly have no animus, personal animus against any uh, Orthodox individual. Um, um, you have a, you have a follow-up, uh, question in the super chat from Karis, um, Calvinism question. If God has his chosen and the rest of us can't be saved and the rest can't be saved and he created humanity out of love, why would God create them just to destroy them? 
how can he be all loving? And I would guess this would probably be the most common, uh, the most common question you guys get about Calvin, uh, Calvinism or Reformed theology. Uh, if not, it's it's definitely got to be in the top three. But how do you guys respond to that? Well, I mean, uh, created them out of love. It's an interesting phraseology. I mean, the Bible says, you know, he created basically out of the pleasure of his of his of his grace you know he, he's what he decided to do because he wanted to do it and you could say it's love it's true but first and foremost i think would be uh putting himself in this in the proper place meaning god i think you can properly say this loves himself you know he doesn't want to violate the first commandment which is to have no other gods before god god is rightly the center of everything it's not an ego thing. It's just the facts. It's reality. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean? Uh, well, ultimately, creation, this re story of redemption that happens as uh, history unfolds that, you know, the person is alluding to, it's for God's glory. And that's where SDG, solely Deo Gloria, comes through, for the glory of God alone. And really, that's consistent with the biblical revelation. God says to Pharaoh, I raised you up so I can make my name great. And Paul exegetes that along with other important things from the Old Testament, as well as the current situation when he's writing in Romans 9 through 11. And he says that when someone brings up that very objection, that they have to really realize their creaturely place in the world. And that's why when you see Job, where someone, Job's like, hey, what about, you know, God doesn't really directly answer. Here's why I did this. He says, basically, I laid this all in wisdom. You know, I'm the creator. I'm the owner. So you, you, your creaturely position doesn't allow you the proper vantage point to understand. And ultimately, we're not entitled to have an answer from God. As C.S. Lewis has said, you know, and this relates to other things, but we are not putting God in the docks, meaning we're, you know, sitting in the judgment seat of him. And so the interesting thing about that question is, you know, the rest of us can't get saved. Does the person assume that everyone will get saved? If 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 what though? Like what are the conditions for someone to be saved? Because the way the Bible portrays it is that we are all enemies of God. Christ died we were while we were still yet sinners. We're at enmity, we're at war. Romans three, there's none who seek God, no not one. And so there seems to be an underlying assumption of, well, if God would have just you know, if, if he would just allow these other people to get saved, they would. It's God is choosing to sovereignly regenerate people out of the people who are rebellious towards their king who would not get saved any otherwise, any other way, except by miraculous redemption, except by miraculous intervention, except by his hand that changes out the heart of stone into one of flesh. And so really the biblical message is we're not seeking after God. We're not trying to get saved. The only reason anyone does get saved is because God bestows his grace upon him. And that's where we've got to really wrestle with the biblical text, because what's it say? I will mercy whom I mercy. That's the, the literal rendition, but you see it most, it sounds weird in English, so most of the time you see it translated this way. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. And and so that's why a reformed idea is not God chose me. It should be God, why me? And the answer is we don't know. God doesn't ever say other than for his own glory. And really, Ephesians 1 and 2 are paramount to this discussion and Romans 9 through 11 are also paramount to this discussion. Um, Alan Rule asks, uh, Anthony and Vocab, what do you think about Gordon H. Clark? Any Smart guy. Who asked that? Who was that? Alan Rule. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, he was definitely a smart guy. He certainly has valuable stuff, but I would, I would disagree with him on quite a number of things. Uh, but he, he does have a lot of good books. Yeah. You know, in general, on philosophy, for example, he wrote a good book called Thales to Dewey. I probably got about 20, 25 books by Gordon Clark. Uh, he was a prolific writer. He was a philosophy teacher uh, and a Christian uh, and a Presbyterian, by the way. But uh, he, uh, part of my disagreement with Gordon Clark is that Gordon Clark would identify, when he talks about a presupposition, he's just talking about an axiom. He's saying we have this axiom and we're just going to begin with this. We arbitrarily choose it and, uh, you know, and, and then work everything out from there. 
uh, he, when he would describe the, the Christian presuppositions, he would say things like this. Uh, uh, we only know uh, what God has told us in the Bible. And that's not what I mean by presuppositionalism. I'm saying that God reveals himself in the Bible and, and also through the created order. And it's in terms of God's revelation that we're able to know other things. So we can know other things using our reasoning, using our, our senses and so forth. But what Gordon Clark did was he ended up saying that we can only know what's stated in Scripture or by logic can be deduced from Scripture. And I think that's problematic. How would Gordon Clark know that he is saved? Because Scripture never mentions Gordon Clark. Scripture never mentions me. But Scripture does say, whoever believes shall be saved. I can know that I believe right? But I don't know that because Scripture tells me I believe. I know that on other grounds, right? So I, I just think there's problems there, and this isn't a whole critique of, of Clark, but uh, there's a lot of good in Clark, so don't... Uh, but I also think that some of his followers were pretty rancorous, like uh, John Robbins of the Trinity Foundation. Uh, you know, he so venerated Gordon Clark that he could he could count as a Protestant who had icons. Hmm. <laughs> um, just we, saying... Uh, we, we, we want to close out. We want to definitely close out uh, within the next eight minutes. Um, Frank Christian in the Super Chat says, Praise Jesus. J.J. Har said, Got to be fair with my Super Chats. Uh, we have two questions from Hexitas. Uh, Hexitas said, um, Presup at its best points out weaknesses in other religions and naturalism. Can it refute generic, non-revelatory theism? Um, and then he says, is there historical evidence needed? Uh, I'm not sure what he means by historical evidence needed. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know if he means historical evidence about Christianity or something like that. But so uh, generic non-revelatory theism. In other words, there are people who are just theists. They believe that uh, that God created the universe, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that they... They can then explain how the universe got here, why it's finely tuned, where human beings came from, why there are objective moral values, why there are logical laws, why there are all of these things. But without believing in Christianity, how would presuppositionalism respond to that? Well, yeah. I mean, just so uh, the person knows, I'll, I'll let you go with that, Anthony, but just a few things. Um, that person doesn't have any anything that they are holding to that that is relevant for salvation in a sense you know james says the demons they believe in god they, you know they shake and tremble and uh polytheists they believe in god they believe in gods you know what i mean but like and then the deist of old had to, but but they they're still bifurcated between those who are in christ and those who are not so so I don't, I don't, I didn't fully follow all the contours well, of that question. Yeah, that, well, I think, I think the idea is um, that, like, like Anthony was, like Anthony was saying, if he's talking to a mathematician, he's going to explain how you, 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 you can't really be consistent as a mathematician or, or a scientist or an atheist can't be consistent because he wants to make moral claims and so on. What if you had a theist who believes in God and thus can account for? mathematics and Allegedly. uniformity of nature and all these things because anthony wants to keep saying no you need the triune god of scripture to serve as the foundation for those things and so what what are you thinking anthony yeah so it's unfortunate we only have five minutes left but that's fine i mean uh so i'll say a couple of things here and then make a, a suggestion about how this could be pushed further uh, but in the first place, it's important to remember, and this is something that presuppositionalists want to keep pointing out to fellow Christians, is that uh, if we're going to construct an apologetic, we have to listen to Scripture uh, in the process, right? And one of the things that Scripture says is not simply that God has made the existence of some kind of generic God known, but he's made himself known. When Paul says in Romans 1, for example, that the unbeliever knows God. He literally says, Nantes tan theon, knowing the God. He's not talking about some generic conception of God. And so our apologetic should, should mirror that. Uh, Hexodus' question is a good one. Uh, but notice, that's not something that you get in the particular arguments, say, of classical apologetics or, or what have you. What you are getting is a kind of general theism. In fact, uh, William Lane Craig will often point out that these arguments just prove a kind of general theism, and so we need to take the further step of giving historical evidence. 
Now, I've already said I don't reject using historical evidence, but I do believe the argument, the transcendental argument, goes much further than simply a generic theism. I gave something of an illustration of that when showing how Islam can't do it. And it's not enough just to say that there's some kind of vague notion out there of a god, a kind of heavenly whatchamacallit or celestial tapioca. Uh, that's not going to cut it in terms of accounting for all the things that we've been talking about. You need a God whose character is consistent, uh, a God who makes himself known so that we know that he's there, so that we can know about uniformity, so we can know about morality. It's not just that, uh, you know, metaphysically, we need the conditions that are necessary for accounting, say, for the non-natural character of laws, but we also need a God whose ethical character accounts for the content of those laws. So now here, here, since we don't have a lot of time, Here's what I was going to say is is the ultimate version of this, and you might have to wait till my Shabir debate. Ultimately, what Van Til argued is that the most fundamental problem of philosophy, what gave birth to philosophy, is something that only Christianity can account for, and it's the problem of the one and the many. The one and the many is the fundamental problem of philosophy. Most philosophers are are so uh, you know spent on this problem that they've completely given up on it. But if you look back at the pre-Socratics, Thales and Aximander and Eximenes, all these guys, what they were trying to do is account for unity and diversity, how the world is characterized both by oneness and by manyness. And ultimately what I would say, and I don't have enough time to work it out, but it's only in terms of a God who is himself both one and many that we can account for the unity and diversity of the world that's necessary to make it intelligible. All right, rap, rapid fire here. Uh, which presuppositionalist, this also from Hexitas, uh, which presuppositionalist is philosophically most credible? Uh, that's one part. Uh, go ahead and answer that real quick. Which presuppositionalist is philosophically most credible? Well, Bonson. Van Til was a philo philosopher as far as his training. So was Bonson. You know, he got his degree, I believe, from USC. Uh, K. Scott Oliphant, who sits in the chair at Westminster, uh, you know, v Van Til's chair today uh philosophically trained as well uh john frame uh, as well you know so i mean there's uh there's a variety to choose from i think you were going to say bonson you think is probably the most systematic and consistent <clears throat> though well, so i i would recommend bonson over others in the sense that van till was writing from a particular context that's foreign to most people uh first of all he came from a dutch background but then secondly uh, Van Til was uh, educated under idealist philosophers, which most people aren't familiar with. So he used the language of idealists to communicate Christian truths. And so a lot of people stumble when they read Van Til. They don't understand him. And But Bonson was, was uh, uh, reared in the analytic tradition, so he does end up being much more uh, systematic in his presentation. I would say that Frame is probably the clearest. He's, he's one of the, the best writers as far as that goes. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. There are other uh, scholars that are good representatives of precept. Um, second part, is it warranted, pun intended, to call Planiga's views presuppositionalism light? Um, uh, there's no way Planiga is a, is a Vantillian uh, presuppositionalist, but I would say Planiga is extremely presuppositional. Um, I mean, Plan I think so. Yeah. Anthony's smarter than I am, and I have heard Planiga be called that and certain things he does like the idea of god being properly basic mm -hmm. i think are very friendly towards a precept view well even and then also uh how he has evolution fight naturalism that seems very that seems decidedly presuppositional to me but uh that's just my mm -hmm. thought yeah a, lo a lot of the stuff i said in my debate with Shermer, uh, uh planiga has said that but I i'm i'm mainly thinking of he had a he had a famous lecture called uh two dozen or so arguments for the existence of god but those are those are massively presuppositional arguments. It would be things like, you know, uh, hey, Mozart is better than Metallica. Um, if atheism is true, then I'm just I'm just kind of wired to believe that Mozart is better than Metallica, and therefore Mozart isn't really better than Metallica. But Mozart is really better than Metallica. Therefore, God exists. And so he he do these arguments, and, and atheists let, just make fun of them because they're not really thinking on a very deep level. Like, what is it that makes you know, something spectacular uh, and brilliant better than something else. And, you know, if, if, for those of you who are fans of Metallica and you hate Mozart and stuff, this won't make sense, but pick someone you really, really like and you think is clearly just indisputably 
better. And Plan is going to want to say you're, 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 you, there is some, there's, there's an underlying standard of beauty there, just like there is in morality and, and other things. And so he, yeah, he does that. He does that sort of thing uh, a lot. Any thoughts on that, Anthony? Yeah, yeah, quickly. It'll allow me to get in a parting shot at vocab and frame. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe some of you have read the book. I don't know if it was, uh, was it Four Views on Apologetics? Have you read that? So in that book, it's actually really interesting. Uh, William Lane Craig, whom I think is a, a giant of a Christian intellect, he's a, an asset to the Christian church, does a great job doing apologetics. I enjoy watching his debates, even though I don't take his, his method. Uh, but I still think he slaughters non-Christians and so forth and, and does a good job defending the faith. Uh, but in there, one of the criticisms that he made of Frame, which is a criticism often made against presuppositionalism, is that it's circular. Now, we don't have the time to talk about all that, but what I thought was funny is what many people miss about the strength of presuppositionalism is one thing that I thought Frame kind of faltered on, and that's the transcendental argument. Frame didn't recognize the fundamentally different kind of argument that a transcendental argument is. He thought it was just another kind of argument, as opposed to just a, a, a unique kind of argument more along the lines of what Kant or Aristotle were doing. Uh, but um, what was interesting to me is in that book, uh, when, when Craig uh, was responding to Frame, he, he said uh, it's better for somebody uh, to go follow the likes of Alvin Plantinga, who actually gives us a transcendental argument. And I thought that was grand, because I was the whole time I was reading Frame, I was thinking, He's just he's he's not giving the the heart and soul of what Van Til was 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 pushing for, uh, a distinctive kind of argument uh, that that just completely blasts unbelieving thought, and and so uh, a lot of people will accuse it of just being circular, but it's the transcendental character of it that prevents it from being circular, and so I thought it was funny because uh, William Lane Craig says you should go with the transcendental argument like Plantinga, and I'm thinking that's exactly what Van Til does, so. But I'm not saying that uh, planning was a full-blown presuppositionalist. I'm just throwing that in here. So the takeaway of Anthony's talk there is uh, don't listen to Frame. He doesn't know what he's talking about. All right. <laughs> oh, I love Frame. Uh, I think the only questions left are, uh, uh, well, MJ Jackson commented. He said, Ronald Nash was an inductive presuppositionalist, which uh, he drew from both Carnell and Clark. And uh, Jun Kim said, was Muhammad actually a Christian? Um, no. Now, I think you can describe him, you know, the, the Islamic movement as a heretical Christian movement. Um, you you yeah, could do that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you could, at best, you could say he was a heretical, very, very heretical uh, Christian. All right. Any yeah, other? I think Nash is great. He's probably my favorite kind of semi-Clarkian. Out of the Clarkians I know, although the Clarkians I know of are decidedly brilliant, but they have problems getting along with people on a practical level from what I've seen. And uh, the common accusation against them, and I think there's some merit to it, is that they are doing a form of rationalism. Not that they're being rational, but a specific critique. And last thing is, about the math stuff, there's a guy, Vern Poitras, who has yeah. a background in, in math and philosophy and theology. Yep. has a book that you can get it on Crossway, or it's free on his website, <clears throat> frame-poitras.org, called Redeeming Mathematics. I've read God that book. I've read that book. You, so you like it? Chapter 2 specifically deals with what Anthony was speaking of earlier, the problem of the one of many. Chapter 2 is all about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, interesting book. I mean, he, he points out that, you know, mathematical truths, they're, they're true anywhere you go in the universe. You could go to the Andromeda galaxy. The, these mathematical truths are still applying. He's, he, he's claiming that they are, they are, in a sense, omnipotent, right? You can't violate them. And so uh, interesting stuff. But yeah. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So, all right. I guess we have to uh, we have to wrap up now, guys. I uh, went a couple minutes over. Uh, any final thoughts? Brief, brief final thoughts. What? No. I wish I could learn how to become a better popularizer of Framian thought. I wish I, I, I want to one day get a, a little bit smart enough and a little bit more well read enough and a little bit more clear to me where I could popularize. Uh, Framian version of presuppositionalism, but I don't know if I'll literally be able to do it. I wish I was a little bit smarter. I wish I was a baller. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, final thoughts, Anthony? Yeah, I just want to say I wish uh, Vocab would get uh, better at describing presup. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 
<laughs> just I think we all want vote. I think we all want vocab to get a little bit smarter. <laughs> Nice, guys. I love it. Got him. my best interest in mind. That's good. <laughs> By the way, I just dropped uh, the link to that book, the free PDF, which they uh, give away, so it's not sound like scam in the live chat. Yeah, I'll throw this in. There's a great book if you haven't seen it by I think it's John Bile. It's definitely Bile called The Divine Challenge, and in there he talks about science, he talks about math, he just he talks about all sorts of things, and he's got a, a very different way of kind of laying out some of these same things, and uh, I think it'd be very helpful for people. All right, guys, we're closing out now. Thank you, everyone, for watching, uh, especially those of you who made it through all two hours and uh, and five minutes. Um, happy to continue doing live streams. Not sure I'll be on tomorrow. Uh, we'll be back definitely Sunday live streaming. We'll see what happens uh, tomorrow, but we'll keep uh, we'll keep we'll keep uh, we'll keep trying to do as many live streams as we can uh, during the coronavirus um, pandemic oh, vocab. quarantine. Vocab should announce his show for tomorrow night. Oh yeah, no. If you're going, if you're going live, I won't go live. Then, then tell everyone no, to go no, over. No, there. no, no, no. Check it, check it, check it out. I'm going live tomorrow, but but uh, we have a show. Me, you, David, on on for a Flutang Clan. Me, you, and John McRae. Supposed When's to that? Be. That's tomorrow. Sunday night. Oh yeah, that's Sunday. what I said. I said Sunday. I'd be okay. back on. Yeah. And then and then Tuesday is me, you, John, and Adam. The four of us. We that... haven't decided those topics yet. That'll be my birthday, so maybe we'll just uh, just have show. a big birthday bash. But what what is it that you're doing tomorrow, vocab? I'm, yeah. Oh, we're, we're, yeah. We're oh, saying plug Anthony. that. Oh yes, Anthony and I are going live tomorrow. Oh, so so sorry. At eight o'clock. You know, the reason I mention it is because it's relevant to this channel, right? Yes, it's, yes, yes. So sorry, and and uh, we're going to respond to a Muslim apologist who did a critique of the Boom Boom Room, in which he did also a, an impression. Well, what the, what, of, the, what, of what, the, what the heck? You're doing that without me? I've known Sadiq for years. No, no it's no, Edishav. Huh? Oh, and Sadiq? Is it Sadiq? Wait, no, what? I'm doing Sadiq at a different show. Okay, this who's is, this? Uh, Edishav. Edishav oh, Edishav. I've known Edishav for years, too. <laughs> you want to you join the show? I'll, I'll, I'll jump on your show, yeah. All right, all three of us. This will be epic. All right. So, everyone, uh, we will be on Vocab's channel, 8 o'clock p.m. tomorrow, um, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. And we will be, uh, I don't even know. I don't even know what Vocab's got for us, but he's going to, we're going to be, uh, he's going to be playing it's some clips of, of the Stephen Hawking episode of the Boom Boom Room. He, he criticizes it and says how we're wrong on it and says you're did, a liar. And all didn't we make? Didn't we make Muhammad the hero of that episode? That was like yeah, the, that was the nice. That was the nicest we've ever been to Muhammad. And he says no scientific mistakes in the Quran. In Quran, and he imitates you, and it's pretty cruel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna play it. All, I'm play all the clips tomorrow, bro. Well, I I, I can't. I, I I don't know how I would deal with someone who's being cruel uh, towards me. I couldn't put up with that. Um, all right, so everyone, yeah, we're gonna be on. And uh, all right, we will uh, we'll see you then. Hope to. So everyone, go over to Vocab's channel. Uh, the link to his channel is in the description box. So click on there and subscribe so that you get notifications when we're live on on Vocab's channel. We'll see you then, and then we'll be back on my channel on Sunday. All right. Thanks you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vocab and Anthony for. Joining us here, and catch you all later. Peace. I dropped the link in the live chat. Thanks for reminding me, Anthony. Yeah.